Now that we've talked about the different types of microcytic anemias, let's turn our attention to the macrocytic anemias, which can be divided into megaloblastic or non-megaloblastic macrocytic anemias. In megaloblastic macrocytic anemias, the main problem is with DNA synthesis. Megaloblasts refer to the presence of many large, immature, and dysfunctional red blood cells called megaloblasts in the bone marrow. During erythropoiesis, RBCs grow and undergo several cell divisions. If synchronized correctly, the cells will divide at about the same rate as cell growth, resulting in twice the number of cells that are slightly smaller or the same size as the original cell. If DNA synthesis is not keeping up with cell growth, then cells will grow more between each cell division. When these blood cells make it to circulation, they will be fewer in number, larger in size, and less mature. The two major causes of macrocytic anemia are vitamin B12 and folate deficiency. These are both megaloblastic, and they both have the same characteristic and often tested feature of hypersegmented neutrophils, as shown in this blood smear. These nutritional deficiencies both alter the synthesis of nucleic acid, as we reviewed in our biochemistry chapter, and have very similar presentations. Macrocytic anemia, glossitis, hypersegmented neutrophils, and increased homocysteine. Importantly, however, vitamin B12 deficiency will have additional neurologic symptoms secondary to methylmalonic acid buildup. Symptoms such as paresthesias, dementia, impaired proprioception, spasticity, and ataxia may be noted. Vitamin B12 deficiency can be caused by malnutrition. Think of a pure vegan with no animal products in his or her diet. Malabsorption, as in Crohn's disease. Pernicious anemia, or infection by the fish tapeworm, Diphilobothrium latium. Remember our friend D. latum from microbiology? It is important that your body stores of vitamin B12 will last longer than folate. So while folate deficiency can occur pretty quickly, say within a few months of adopting a poor diet, vitamin B12 deficiency will take a year or more to develop. Folate deficiency can be caused by a decreased intake, as seen in malnutrition and alcoholism, malabsorption, impaired metabolism caused by drugs such as methotrexate or trimethoprim, as well as increased demand, like in pregnancy. You might recall our discussion of orotic acid urea from biochemistry. It results from a genetic mutation in an enzyme from the synthetic pathway of uridine. It causes megaloblastic anemia that does not correct with the administration of folate or vitamin B12. Instead, you would give these patients uridine monophosphate, which bypasses the defective step and allows DNA synthesis to proceed. The non-megaloblastic macrocytic anemias can be caused by liver disease, alcoholism, and certain drugs. Reticulocytosis will also result in a non-megaloblastic macrocytic anemia, since reticulocytes are larger than mature erythrocytes with a higher MCV. Now we'll discuss the normal size anemias. The normocytic normochromic anemias may be classified as either hemolytic or non-hemolytic. Hemolytic anemias can be further classified into extrinsic, if the cause of the hemolysis is due to something outside the RBC, or intrinsic, if the cause of the hemolysis is a problem with the RBC itself. The hemolytic anemias can also be classified as either intravascular or extravascular, depending on the location of the hemolysis. Intravascular hemolysis occurs when RBCs are destroyed in the bloodstream, in conditions like paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, autoimmune hemolysis, or mechanical destruction, as seen with aortic stenosis or prosthetic valves. The body works really hard to preserve hemoglobin, so after RBCs are hemolyzed, a protein called haptoglobin binds free hemoglobin and recycles it in the spleen. So would high or low haptoglobin be an indicator for intravascular hemolysis? Low haptoglobin would be an indicator for intravascular hemolysis, because the haptoglobin has bound the free hemoglobin and the entire complex has been taken out of circulation to be recycled in the spleen. These patients will also have high levels of lactate dehydrogenase, or LDH. This is because LDH is at very high concentrations inside the RBCs, and with all the intravascular hemolysis, LDH levels rise in the serum. Extravascular hemolysis occurs in the reticuloendothelial system, 
mainly in the spleen, in conditions where the RBC surface looks funny to splenic macrophages. Macrophages will take up or extravascularly hemolyze those RBCs. Conditions such as spherocytosis, sickle cell, and G6PD deficiency will basically cause these cells to be stiff or abnormally shaped and lacking in that important biconcave disc shape, so they can't quite squeeze through the cords of the spleen and they get taken up by the macrophages. These patients will also have an elevated LDH, and in addition, they may get an unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia that leads to jaundice. Our question here is, will extravascular hemolytic diseases show a decreased haptoglobin in the serum? And the answer is no. Haptoglobin will remain normal. This is because macrophages that phagocytize the RBCs inside the spleen will not release this hemoglobin as free hemoglobin. And so, the haptoglobin will not bind to free hemoglobin that is not present, and haptoglobin levels will remain normal. Let's talk about the non-hemolytic anemias before we go into more depth about the specific intra- and extravascular hemolytic anemias. There are three main types we'll talk about. These include the anemia of chronic disease, aplastic anemia, and our kidney disease-related anemias. Anemia of chronic disease will occur in patients with chronic illness and inflammation. Inflammation upregulates hepcidin, which is released by the liver. Hepcidin then blocks the release of iron, from iron stores in macrophages, and blocks the production of transferrin that transports iron in the blood. Transferrin is also known as total iron binding capacity. In the presence of hepcidin, the serum will show low levels of iron and low levels of transferrin. But iron stores are actually available in the macrophages. They simply can't be mobilized because of the presence of hepcidin. Since iron stores are high, ferritin levels are high, because ferritin is the protein that stores iron, and it is how we track the amount of stored iron. So why would the body want to sequester iron in this way? Well, the body's logic is that if some foreign invader or infectious agent is there causing inflammation in the first place, you don't want it having access to iron, because these infectious agents are often dependent on the body's iron for themselves. So the body hides all of the iron in an attempt to starve some unknown infectious agent of iron. All of this happens regardless of the root cause of this chronic illness or inflammation, even if it's not infectious. The body doesn't necessarily know what's causing the inflammation. It just knows that there is inflammation and therefore releases hepcidin. Of note, if this occurs for a long period of time, Anemia of chronic disease can present like iron deficiency anemia and be microcytic and hypochromic. It is not always normocytic. One can distinguish between iron deficiency anemia and anemia of chronic disease by looking at ferritin levels, which tell you how iron stores are doing. Ferritin will be low in iron deficiency because stores are low and high in anemia of chronic disease because stores are high. Aplastic anemia is a condition where myeloid stem cells fail or are destroyed. If you look at the marrow of someone with aplastic anemia, it's pretty much empty. This is called a dry tap. It means that not only will you have low levels of RBCs or an anemia, you'll also have a severe neutropenia and a severe thrombocytopenia. In other words, this is pretty much a pancytopenia, and it's usually very severe. There are many different causes, like radiation exposure, and several viruses, importantly Parvo B19, HIV, and Epstein-Barr virus, DNA repair defects like Fanconi anemia, and a lot of drugs that include several cancer drugs, as well as the antibiotic chloramphenicol. There are even immune ideologies that can cause aplastic anemia. Symptoms are related to blood cell deficiencies. Low RBCs cause the anemia, low WBCs lead to the infections, and low platelet counts promote mucosal bleeding and petechiae. To treat these patients, you have to treat the underlying cause, but you can also transfuse them in the short term and give granulocyte choline a stimulating factor, or GCSF, to manage symptoms. The last non-hemolytic normochromic anemia is the chronic kidney disease. You may have gone into this in the renal chapter, 
But can you think of a reason why kidney disease would give you an anemia? The simplest answer is erythropoietin. So the kidneys are responsible for EPO production that stimulates the process of erythropoiesis. Low EPO leads to decreased hormonal signaling for hematopoietic processes. And ultimately, this causes a normocytic anemia. For patients with kidney disease who have this form of anemia, you'll need to treat with erythropoietin injections, which can almost entirely reverse this anemia.